Good evening, everyone. I'm Susan Kahn, the Dean of the Tyler School of Art and Architecture, and I'd like to welcome you to, tonight, uh, to tonight's annual Jack Wolgen Visiting Artist Lecture. On January 28, 2022, the Collegial Assembly at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture endorsed the use of an indigenous land acknowledgement to recognize the history of the native peoples who originally inhabited the lands on which the school sits. We developed this acknowledgement with the Lenape Nation of Philadelphia. Before we begin our formal program, I would like to recognize that the Tyler School of Art and Architecture stands on the indigenous territory known as Lenape Hoking, the traditional homelands of the Lenape people. These are the people who negotiated in the 1680s with William Penn to facilitate the founding of the colony of Pennsylvania. As part of this land acknowledgement, we reflect on the need to be stewards of the land, and we urge you to join with the Lenape Nation, who still live here, to protect and preserve the lands and the waters. So, this is the fifth annual artist talk in the ongoing program at Tyler, generously supported by a bequest from the art collector and renowned philanthropist, Jack Wolgen. The Wolgen Artist in Residence Program brings distinguished artists to our community to spend several days mentoring our students and delivering a public lecture. Tonight, as you know, of course, we have the great honor of welcoming Hito Styrel as our 2023 Wolgen Artist. Jack Wolgen was a successful real estate developer and an avid art collector who was instrumental in developing Center City here in Philadelphia. Among his many gifts to the city was his commissioning of the mammoth clothespin sculpture by Klaus Oldenburg that sits at 15th and Market Streets. Wolgen was born in Philadelphia in 1917 and lived to be 93 years of age. He was not an alum of Temple University. He went to Penn State and the University of Pennsylvania. But he chose Temple as the recipient of a very large bequest that makes this annual program possible. Because as a civic leader, Jack Wolgen wanted to enrich the lives of students at a public school that reflects the diversity and vitality of the city itself. This gift has enabled us to bring such distinguished artists as Jenny C. Jones, Rick Lowe, Judy Pfaff, Latoya Ruby Frazier, Cecilia Vicuña, and Nick Cave. And of course, tonight, Hito Starrell. In keeping with Jack Wolgen's wishes, every talk is followed by a reception, and we invite you to join us for this reception tonight, directly following the talk. It's gonna be at Tyler, which is about a 10 minute walk from here, and if you don't know where Tyler is, you can pick up one of these postcards on your way out, and it has a little map. Kia Carter-Simmons, Associate Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs here at Tyler, organized Hito's visit, and she and Wanda Odom, our Assistant Dean for Strategic Communications, did an amazingly uh, terrific job um, handling every detail of this project. I'd like to note that there is a work by uh, Dr. Styrell entitled Strike that is currently on view in the Edgar Heap of Birds Family Gallery at Temple Contemporary, our exhibition space in Tyler. Um, Hito will be discussing this work tonight and I would like to invite you to view the work when we get back to Tyler and I thank Andrew Krebs Gallery uh, for making that loan possible. Our decision to invite Hito comes at a pivotal moment in Tyler's development as a school. We have emerged from the pandemic with renewed energy to activate our mission of educating and inspiring students to be active citizens through their creative work and their scholarship. Tyler is making very considered pedagogical decisions about who we invite to address our community and why. One of our agreed core values is to explore the intersections and interstices of media and disciplines as spaces of discovery and creation of new knowledge and new ways of seeing the world. We are a multidisciplinary school with timely, relevant pedagogical content, and we are currently developing a new program in critical media studies and production, so stay tuned to hear more about that. As an artist who produces work at the intersection of digital culture, politics, and visuality, we feel strongly that our students have much to learn from Hito Styrel. 
She produces playful and serious explorations of technology and power structures, cultural critiques that are particularly relevant today. She was born in Munich and currently lives in Berlin. In, in, and she, of course, is an internationally acclaimed artist, prolific writer, and cultural critic. She is currently a professor of experimental film and video at the University of the Arts in Berlin, where she founded the research for proxy politics together with Vera Tolman and Boaz Levin. In the past few years, and her exhibition record is way too long to go into uh, comprehensively, but in the past few years, she has had solo exhibitions at the Portland Art Museum, National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Seoul, Korea, Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, Centre Pompidou in Paris, Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, the Park Avenue Armory in New York, Serpentine Gallery in London, Kunst Museum in Basel, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, and that is just in the last few years. She is the recipient of many honors and accolades, including my favorite, being named the most influential person in contemporary art by the British publication Art Review in 2017. I don't know how they figured out who was the single most influential, but somehow they did. But most importantly, she is a brilliant, passionate, and principled thinker and practitioner. When you read about Starrell, sometimes it's about her work, and sometimes it's about her refusal to capitulate to power structures that dehumanize, undervalue, and destroy by removing her presence and imprimatur. So tonight, we are especially fortunate to have Hito Starrell join us. Please welcome her and thank her for giving us this gift. Thank you for this most generous introduction and invitation also to Kea, who organized everything brilliantly, also to Nick and Arjun, who resolved a quite serious technological situation, but now we are all set. And thanks, uh, everyone, for being here tonight. It's an honor and a pleasure to be teaching here for the week. Um, yeah, maybe uh, I thought I'd just go through my work. Usually, you know, before these talks, I start to reconsider my work and to find some point of entry into it, which I think is relevant at the moment right now. And it's also what I did for tonight. Um, but let me just add a preface, um, especially tonight. Um, there will be some images of destruction, not necessarily ac actual violence, but destruction, and I want to be mindful of people who would be disturbed of it, so I'm just saying this in advance. Not very many, but there are some. And I think it's, I don't know if it's avoidable or not, but I think the whole lecture will be all about the question of seeing and not seeing and unseeing and n not knowing what to see or if one sees and uh, revolve around these questions. Um, I thought this might be a very short point of entry, also kind of concise. It's a very short work, which you mentioned already, um, which is playing in the gallery right now. It's only 20 seconds. It's just a fun. Um, I'm going to show it to you. Uh, okay. So, maybe we have to be careful here not to, not to move the cables too much. So, this is not it, this is it, okay. Half the work is the title. That's it. You can see that was the antiquity of television and flat screens. These devices uh, do not exist anymore. 
Um, I also have to tell you it was photoshopped. I never would manage to create this kind of pattern with just one strike. Usually you need 20 to create such a pattern. Mostly it will just break and that's boring. But the thing, the thing that I wanted to show or reveal or do is basically to reveal this underlying layer, right, of the television, which is not the content that's playing, but the matrix, the thing that's underneath, but that's necessary in order to show any image. And there might be, or there is in some cases, at least in case of this LED uh, device, this underlying layer of infrastructure, which is the basic condition for any kind of visibility or invisibility and whatnot. <laughs> I also thought that probably in this case one should not call it the matrix, but the patrix, but then I stopped thinking about it. Um, of course, it's also a, a reference to a movie that Sergei Eisenstein did in the 20s of the same title, <laughs> I tried to find the a similar font for the title. Um, so basically all these questions about seeing and not seeing, they continue through all my work. And uh, there is one work in particular where they are articulated a lot in form of a kind of manual almost. It's called How Not To Be Seen. Um, and it is based on a short sketch that the British group Monty Python did at some point in the 70s. They did a short skit which was called How Not to Be Seen and they tried to become invisible. And so I tried to basically update this idea for the digital age. Is there any way of not being seen? Uh, this movie was, uh, this film was completed <laughs> very shortly before the Snowden revelations in which it became very clear that it was absolutely impossible not to be seen. But anyway, in this uh, manual video, I'm trying several ways to become invisible, or at least not to be seen. And um, yeah, so I'm going to show you about f five minutes of this, which will give you a better idea. Around 2000. A new standard for resolution targets is introduced. This is a pixel-based resolution chart. It serves to shoot pixels. In 1996, photographic resolution in the area is about 12 meters per pixel. Today it is one foot. To become invisible, one has to become smaller or equal to one pixel. How not to be seen. Lesson four. There are 13 ways of becoming invisible by disappearing. Living in a gated community. Living in a military zone. Being in a Factory or museum. Owning an antique apparatus a handbag. Being fitted with an invisibility cloak. Be 
being a superhero, being female and over 50, surfing the dark web, being a dead pixel, being a Wi-Fi signal moving through human bodies, being a documented old form, being spam caught by a filter, being a disappeared person as an enemy of the state, eliminated, liquidated, and then the simulated. In the decades of the digital revolution, 170,000 people disappeared. Disappeared people are annihilated, eliminated, eradicated. Deleted, dispensed with, filtered, processed, selected, separated, wiped out. Invisible people retreat into 3D animations. They hold the vectors of the mesh and keep the picture together. They re-emerge as pixels. Okay. Um, yeah, in this work, I was very fascinated by these, these spaces, which are resolution charts in the California desert, which were used to calibrate cameras. And now they are dilapidated and just, you know, these strange objects that are abandoned and are basically falling apart. And this is also something which I um, basically tried to hint at in the installation form that this work took. There were several visibility objects. The resolution chart is recreated also on the floor. and. Uh, there are different calibration objects for analog photography. So, you know, my, my work is like this archaeology of obsolete media to some degree. And uh, these calibration charts, I think, are no longer in use just as the resolution charts in the desert. Um, in, in this Last part of the video I showed you, I referred to disappeared people and um, to the fact that they are not seen. And this has a very real precedent in my life and also in a series of works I made around the issue of the di disappearance of one of my close friends um, called Andrea Wolf. She keeps reappearing in several of my films. and. Um, there, of course, the issue of visibility is articulated in a, in a very different way, but also the issue of invisibility, which can become a form of protection also from surveillance, but also from persecution. I'm going to show you the first few minutes of that work so you know what it is about. And I think this is also very much, but I um, will expand on this later about trying to become an image or the different ways in which people try to become images. Um, yeah, maybe four, four minutes. My best friend when I was 17 was a girl called Andrea Wolf. In 1998, she was shot as a Kurdish terrorist. He 
this is my first film. This is me. This is Andrea. It's impossible to reconstruct the story of the film. Only the fighting scenes were shot, showing a gang of three girls trying to clumsily beat up every male they can get their hands on. The film was silent because the only sports we could steal had no sound. And Andrea was its charismatic, strong and beautiful center. The last time I have seen Andrea was two years before she went underground, five years before she was executed in Kurdistan. They took her prison. One could hear her voice. The voice of Comrade Romain was full of fear. She screamed. First her voice fell silent, then the one of Comrade Romain. Then Comrade Romain was killed. There are strange coincidences with the material we shot almost 15 years earlier, back in Bavaria, where we grew up. In the film, we are constantly fighting, probably for justice, and the ethic code of the film is that only villains use weapons, and the good guys and girls use their bare hands for fighting. gets shot and Andrea survives. She picks up the weapon, executes the villain and rides off into the sunset on a motorbike. Buddy never came back. What came back instead was this poster. It says, Mataya Runahi, taken prisoner by Turkish security forces as a fighter in the Free Women's Army Kurdistan and murdered. The four revolutionaries are immortal. Yeah. So that's just the beginning of this um, video which tries to tell a story which at that time was completely inaccessible for me because it was so far away, it was also in a zone which was um, not accessible, it was in a military security zone and um, apart from that no one really knew where it was exactly. So basically faced with this amount of total invisibility of the facts or trying to get even close to the facts. This is an attempt to sort of find proxies, you know, to tell the story, with the proxies being this exploitation um, film we made um, in Super 8, etc. So basically to find stand-ins to tell some a story which was at that point in time completely invisible. And this um, basically um, story had a lot of different iterations and here I'm not going to show you the film actually because there's a bit maybe too much destruction in it. But this is a later iteration where actually I go to the site where all of this happened. It was a complete coincidence. It was actually not really possible, but somehow we managed to slip through and we found the, the spot where it happened, a sort of battlefield, um, which 
was already a few years old and also not very remarkable, quite small and a lot of debris, etc. around it. And the work I made from this um, is a work called Abstract, double screen, uh, playing on two monitors. And on the left hand side, you usually see me with an iPhone and on the right hand side, you see the things I'm filming. The left hand side is in Berlin and the right hand side is in Kurdistan behind me, that's Brandenburg Gate. And it is about also how the devices you're using to make something visible, shape, of course, the, the story or the content in a very um, dramatic form. With the iPhone, it was the first device that had cameras on both ends, right? Which means that there was no more behind the camera in a way. It had a almost 360 or twice 180 field of vision. And this, I sort of exploited this or hacked it to tell a story where I, in front of Brandenburg Gate, am able to see into Kurdistan while being in front of the um, office or headquarters of the weapons factory which, manage, which manufactures all these basically shell cases. So I, I tried, you know, through montage and the devices of cinema to pretend that the iPhone is a magic device which is able to bridge the distance between through montage and to make things visible which happen in a way somewhere completely different but also not because they originate in front of our own houses basically in the, in the metropoles of the West through weapons, weapons exports, etc. And um, this thread of investigation went on for quite a long time. This is something, this is an installation which has, bears the title of the five most popular words and pop songs in the 2010s. So someone really made a statistics of the titles of pop songs and uh, found, figured out that the most, five most popular words were hell, yeah, we, fuck, die, in this order. So I said, whoa, okay. I, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it really sounds like the title of that decade, but I'm really, really afraid, you know, to learn what the title of this decade will be. <laughs> I don't even want to know about it. Well, anyway, so you see these are light boxes, which are also seats. And from these seats, you're able to see a, a three-channel video installations, which again uses a proxy in a way to talk about violence in a sort of indirect way. And this installation has two parts. This is the second one. I'll talk about it in a second, but let me f first show you, um, it's very short, the, the three-channel video that is, oh, okay, I shouldn't touch it, okay, <laughs> Just, yeah. uh, it has a mind of its own now, now I cannot do anything, Okay, that's a bit unfortunate. Let me try this. Okay, good. Better then. Good. Window playlist. Yeah. Okay. So you have to imagine this is on the three video screens. I don't. I don't have a composite uh, recording. I went to the Robot Olympic to film that. <laughs> was, I'll tell you later. <laughs> Can you read it? Robots are developed to go into disaster zones. Thank you. 
Okay, and on it goes. So, yeah, poor, poor robots. I feel with these blue animals particularly. So I, I made a really big one, which is collapsed on, on the floor. And yeah, the robots Olympics were quite funny because I mean now these things are very developed. This was when um, Boston Dynamics dog was really new. But at that time they were so slow. They were like glacial, those robots, and they were supposed to race <laughs> against one another. But, you know, even to go um, 200 meters would take them 20 minutes or so. <laughs> so they, I had to speed up the footage. Yeah. Well, anyway, so this, uh, and a friend of mine made a song which incorporated um, these, these keywords. And it was playing actually close to another, basically, part of this installation. Uh, the second part, which utilized similar elements, but was looked different, a bit more withdrawn. And on this one, there was another video, um, which, again, you know, was very much centered on the question of visibility or invisibility. I'm not going to show you this video. It was uh, in the destroyed city of Diabaka, in which in the 12th century there was an inventor that um, invented automats, precursors to robots. But they were not utilitarian, they were playing music. So he had plans to put them on boats, to play music in, on, on lakes and all of that. So that's basically the city where a lot of the scientific imagination for robots was produced, but that, that was still pretty destroyed, again, by the Turkish army. And in this case, the visibility situation was, uh, again, different. The whole old town, which was being raised, was covered through these huge um, screens, basically. So you could not see what was going on inside for many, many months. And since it was an old town, the, the streets were very narrow, and it was actually possible to seal off a whole city center from sight for quite a long time. And I found those screens quite incredible. I <clears throat> have seen and also filmed many of them, and for me they are almost they, they tell the story even though you can't see anything. And this guy was, you know, suspecting us of taking pictures, etc. So this is basically a whole line of investigation that started with the story of Andrea Wolf and then continues now into something which is maybe a bit more hopeful at the end of the day, or at least starts into an, off into another direction. Um, this is a work which is called or an installation slash video. Very often there is videos, single screen combined with some sort of construction. And this has many elements. This is an AR app um, which puts um, text in space. Um, plus LED screens which show um, plants generated by artificial intelligence and um, also a video which is shown on this screen which turns transparent every once in a while and um, there, is a, there is basically a garden behind the screen. So what kind of garden is it? It's, uh, it's again based on a real story, but also interspersed with these kind of proxy elements which make the story more abstract, but also in a way um, possible to tell at all. Um, I'm going to show you maybe 10, 10 minutes from this work, um, from the single channel video called This is the Future. And how does this connect to seeing? I was really fascinated at that time because 
there was an algorithm. This is the time of early so-called artificial intelligence, generative AI. There was a GAN which um, could look into the future. Why? It was just, it's a next frame prediction algorithm. So it was predicting the next frame, meaning it was supposed to be able to look um, 0 0.04 seconds into the future. And I was super fascinated being a documentary filmmaker, right? This is the thing, this is the device you want, you always, I always wanted to have this kind of camera that could basically see the next step. And of course it's completely, it was very, very dysfunctional. But that was the whole point of it. So I made a whole work basically um, using this algorithm and trying to look into the future, which as you can imagine gets very, very blurry, very, very fast. And you will recognize some of the content from the works I already showed. It basically origin originates in the same uh, context. Oops. This is Heja. She will only appear later in the video. This is a prediction of what she will look like.
The future poses a 100% risk for human health. Statistically, in the future, all humans will die. Entering the future is a massive health hazard. Your body might stretch or fall apart. I told Hedja this was going to happen. Why is she even getting predictions if she doesn't listen?
These are the plants that Hedja is looking for. They transform sunlight into energy. Photosynthesis. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so you see, that's the, that's the plants basically behind the screen which have their own life and which form this kind of garden there properties are described on these LED panels. And um, the idea was to construct a so-called rudderal garden. That's a kind of complicated word to say that these are plants which are attracted by disturbance and destruction. There's some plants which like this kind of conditions, you know, disturbed conditions, and that will basically latch onto these soils and, and uh, grow there. So the idea was to create a, this kind of rudderal garden of these weird future plants with all these properties that grow in this kind of disturbed area. And uh, this not necessarily launched, there was a whole strand of garden activity going on already, also in my work, <laughs> which <laughs> leads to the strange situation that I'm now gardening and doing generative AI at the same time, um, one being much more pleasant than the other. Um, this is a work I did recently, which is a bit different from other works because it relies much more on basically chance or on inputs which I cannot control. Um, it basically translates impulses from these plants um, on the back into music and also animates a neural network which produces kind of similar flower animations. Um, and this whole screen is made of beer bottles because, you know, recently I became very aware that a lot of this technology, of course, has a massive carbon print and it's also not environmentally very sustainable so and also it's mostly proprietary so I mean if you want to open up a TV you have to basically hit it more or less because you're not going to be able to fix parts on your own 
So having a kind of technology which you, in which you can control all the parts, but also which are made of very simple components, um, um, which are durable and last a long time, and which you're able to fix yourself, um, that has become a sort of strand, you know, that I want to also develop further, not only to make them sustainable, but also in a way to um, open up this black box of technology and create things which I can modify myself. This thing is called green screen, by the way. Um, you also probably guessed it. Um, this is another work recent which uh, works with both plants and generative AI. If I say generative AI, then I mean the old ones, the GANs. I don't work with the new transformer models, uh, all these image generators and so on, I, for a lot of different reasons which I'm not going to go into. But these were basically small hand-trained models um, which I was able to in which I was able to control at least many um, of the parameters and aspects myself, especially also power consumption. So, um, yes, and in this work, which also has a um, single channel video, of which I might show you a small part just at the end, um, that's an installation which has these little hanging gardens. There's plants in there. The plants are equipped with sensors and they monitor the plant health, meaning the oxygen, uh, humidity and other factors. And these, these data uh, control these animations, which are paleolithic paintings, which are animated by, by guns. And they morph basically over the, um, over the projection um, creating this kind of interactive cave in which the plants basically control parts of what's going on. And if you ask why cave, etc., then uh, the answer is in the video, as usual, which is called Animal Spirits. And it tells, <laughs> it tells a different story um, of a bunch of shepherds in the Spanish mountains, sorry, just a second, um, which are running something called the Shepherd School, and they also have flocks, etc., and make cheese and milk. And suddenly, a TV company, reality TV company, shows up and announces that they are going to produce a reality TV program called the Shepherd Academy. And this is a real story, and these are real people. And this is basically the, the starting point of the video. The people are bewildered. They don't really, they don't like it. Um, and they want to stop it. And I'm going to show you just the beginning of the video. Um, the guy you're going to see, Nell Shepard, uh, he's a real, what is it called? Rural influencer, it's called. Um, he's, yeah, he has a YouTube channel, which is hugely popular. He, you know, basically tells stories from his life, but mainly also from his life in the mountains uh, and his fights with wolves and against EU bureaucracy. And he, he has quite a style of storytelling, as you will see in a minute. So I will just show you maybe five minutes of this so you get an impression of why there is a cave, etc. My name is John Maynard Keynes. In the year 1936, I came up with a term called animal spirits. Animal spirits happen when markets get out of control and go crazy because of people's emotions. Greed, uh, ambition, uh, fear. But sometimes animal spirits go wild.
encuentres con ellos ahí, casi de noche, con niebla, que apenas se veía dos metros por delante, vamos, como va a pararse tu corazón. Bueno, se dieron cuenta, se han topado conmigo ahí, pero, pero a metro y medio. ¿Ves? Se abre una boca, no le empieza así, y yo ahí, acojonado, sin saber qué hacer. Más luego se visto de noche. Me quedé ahí como una especie de show, donde ya gente recapacitar, tengo que volver a ver a baño, de noche. We found out that you are launching a reality TV show called The Shepherd School. You are actually The Shepherd School and use these names in the beginning of Crazy Thompson Fun. You certainly know this in your uh, TV station report in the month of Nell, es un historiador de 28 años. Dejó la vida de la ciudad para convertirse en pastor hace 9 años. Ha conseguido una gran cantidad de seguidores en YouTube y se hizo conocido como el pastor enojado viral. Utiliza su fama en línea para hablar sobre la importancia del campo. Porque en una ciudad no, no, hay, no hay comida, en la ciudad no hay comida. No, la comida produce en el campo. Nel platica sobre la vida cotidiana de los pastores, sobre todo los problemas del lobo. Para Nel, los lobos son un símbolo de la supervivencia del más apto.
¿Qué pasa? Pues ocurre, recalcando una idea anterior, que el ojo, la esta mentira, da de comer a un montón, a un montón de pichabrados, un montón de dueños de paz, que nunca la vida pichado un montón, sino pichado más los salidos de los caminos de la luz de piedra. Nunca la vida vieron una vida estimada. O sea, vosotros habéis aprendido una doble teoría sobre la realidad. Sobre la realidad, porque lo que tenéis, más. No hay una idea sobre la ecología real. La ecología real es completamente distinta a lo que vosotros pensáis. Vosotros lo que creéis es la ecología misma. Las pasarinos, los sordos, los lobos, cantan y danzan todo a la paz. Y las tijeras hablan, y las escobas barren una vez que hacen vestidos de novio. Así que hay que renunciar a la ecología de Disney y venir a pisar el barrio. Venir a pisar esto. Esto de la ecología de verdad. ¡Hala! ¡Agua! So on, it gets very fictional. Then all my friends apply to join the reality TV show. Rabia, Liam, and so on. Um, and, uh, but the reality TV show is transformed in a crypto coliseum where you have to shoot animals to be transformed into NFTs. John Maynard Keynes makes an appearance and goes crazy. And so on, and so on. And, and the, the shepherds invent a cryptocurrency called the cheese coin. <laughs> the bacteria start talking, and everyone's happy, sort of. <laughs> okay, but this is the cave, and everyone, everyone meets, meets up in this cave where the animals dance on the walls. Um, yeah, and that's what the animation also shows, and it's more or less Uh, partly controlled by the plants. And this is basically where the work is going, but I want to come back to the beginning now, the strike and make a do, because what's now also happening is that all these images that I'm producing, but everyone is producing, end up as training data for new models or neural networks. They are basically ingested to become almost like a raw material or loot or whatever you want to call it to um, basically fuel this new wave of generative AI. And I think the, the, the talk started out with a gesture of striking the screen to see if there's anything underneath, but I think we're in relation to images in a different period of strike now. Uh, this is, oh, you can't read it. He says, my pronouns are pay slash me. This is, a, this is a picture, of course, from the writer strike, which was revolve, resolved, but other people are still on strike. Also, I think gaming actors have joined and so on and so on, which starts a whole new wave of, you know, awareness of the basically production chains of images, digital images, which uh, are not only confined to people producing images, but also annotating them, uh, cleaning them, content moderating, etc. professions which are usually outsourced to low-wage countries, etc. and um, whose workers are partly also starting to Unionize. So I think it's a really exciting moment now in the relation between labor uh, and images, image production. And this is where I want to end. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to sit here and you're supposed to ask questions. So <laughs> I'm already sitting, now you have to ask questions. There is an echo here, maybe I'm gonna move. Better now?
questions back there? production and image production technology as you know a tool that both that like also people can use to challenge these power structures that you know you discuss um, or are we all just sort of like finagled in this weird absurdity that we all live in um, that's been created for us um, or is this is there a space for that to be a tool for um, normal people who need to do things like resistance and etc Thanks for this question. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, definitely the, the tents were marked, you know, by a proliferation of images which spawned a lot of different movements, protests, unrest, etc. But I think that right now we're moving into a new phase which I'm unable to really categorize now in a phase where basically this paradigm is a bit exhausted um, and has also, as we can see now, not led to any sort of sustainable forms of organization, right? It's almost like waves, move of, waves of affect moving through different populations, but there is very little that has been really created in a durable organizational way through these imaged induced uh, movements. And I think the main changes now in image production itself, moving to image generation through you know, transformer models, and th this is a whole new chapter, I think, in image production because we are moving from a sort of digital paradigm which was still somehow tied to photography which needed something in front of a lens to something else entirely, right? To statistical renderings, which basically average data and create plausible predictions of what they think that people want to see. So it's uh, in all respects a new paradigm. Also, be sorry, I'm, I'm ranting because this is <laughs> preoccupying me <laughs> a little. Uh, from an optical paradigm, right, which deals with light and reflection and refraction, but also ties into this, you know, ideas of being tied to the factory, but also to the military's ideas of shots, counter shots, and all of this. I think we're leaving this paradigm to go into something more thermodynamical, right, which um, has ties with heat. I mean, a diffusion model is, uh, this, is the name of the most um, um, popular uh, generative model right now. It's called a diffusion model because it's based on a heat diffusion formula. So we are mo moving into something completely different, which has ties to finance, uh, to the climate, to energy. And I think we need to figure out how, how it works and what the question, how the question of resistance, which is of course primordial and will always exist, how this can reconstitute itself within this new paradigm. I think there was first a question back here. And then. Um, hi, I'm just really curious about the sound design in your videos and films because I don't know how, but I feel like you're really able to capture like the vibe for each of your pieces. So I'm wondering, like, how do you make those like soundtracks? Do you find them, or like, do people help you, or do you mm. just like experiment? Yeah. Um, so before I stole them, I have to admit, <laughs> but I put a lot of care and labor into doing it, 
Uh, it was the most, you know, um, um, the most careful stealing one could imagine. <laughs> yeah, full of love and admiration. But now I've moved more into asking people to basically write tracks for films, and they will have all the freedom, and I will just give them a few keywords. In the last work, um, This is the Future, there's a whole set of tracks by a person called Koji Radical, who lives in London, who just basically riffs on some of the topics that um, the, the film addresses, and this is how I deal with music. And also, in m more recent work, I've started to basically, well, I've always done it, but compile music myself from drones and samples and sound. So it's more going into this direction because I get scared now, you know, of being apprehended because of stealing. A huge fan of your writing and your piece in the film City Poor Image. Um, and in looking at your video work too and your installations, it's interesting to see like the level of production and high quality obviously in them. And so I was curious in because in that piece you kind of talk about the potential nobility of the poor image and what that might mean um, in the future and information sharing, which feels in line with everything else as well. So when you install your um, videos or are working with them, do you think about, or I'm sure you do, but in what ways do you think about like the materiality of the uh, video as you're doing the install? Because they seem so um, incredibly you know, complicated the way the screens are set up. And if you think about that at all in the kind of presentation of your videos, Yes, but I mean, the, the poor image as I wrote, that I wrote about in 2007 does no longer exist, right? It was a four by three image in SD, which yeah. is uh, absolutely obsolete now. I think the standard image now is HD, which I always use. It's, not more, it's no more than that. And in a way, they may look produced by, I, I mostly make them myself, right? <laughs> you can see me flying drones in the Spanish film, so it's still kind of a very handmade, all of, all, all of, all of it, yeah. And also in the installation, I've tried to basically extrude parts of the film into, into space, in many cases, um, to add other aspects to it. Um, yeah, but I'm always trying to simplify, etc. especially in light of sustainability questions. This is, for me, much more important now. I've, 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 um, I think that the successor of the poor image is the power image, right? Whether an image is resolved or not these days doesn't matter. I mean, look at what was it called, Nyan Cat, or you know these 8K NFTs, 8-bit NFTs. So you know it, the lowest resolution can be a super speculative object right now. So resolution as such is no longer really a standard to measure images by, but power consumption is definitely a standard. Um, how much power goes into image? Is it on your machine? Is it in the cloud? How, how does it work? How much render time is consumed and all of this? And I think that the power image, the rich image uses up a lot of power. I mean, in NFTs, definitely this was uh, measured in, in, in minting uh, in, under the power of work protocol, et cetera, et cetera, was extremely energy intensive, right? So I think these questions are more important for me right now than you know, the resolution and what it actually looks like. Hi, Yudo, we have a question from YouTube. Um, a question from- Are we on YouTube? All right, from the viewers at the- Oh, okay, YouTube. great. Okay. 
So it says, what is your main point in creating these films, investigating the nature of reality in the dig digital age? Well, I think that the answer is already in the question, right? So, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I had a question about, I, I find your work very like playful and experimental while also kind of has a serious tone and a clear like, um, like thesis in, in what you showed us. And I was wondering like in your process, if you are feeling like playful and experimental the whole time or if it comes in like occasionally or if you sort of have like a compartmentalized like this is what I'm trying to say and it's also cheeky and funny but or or is it like I don't know you know what I'm trying to say is like do you separate the two or is it does it come out at once the, the playfulness yeah I just wish the process was playful you know <laughs> usually it's inverse if, if the video looks playful in the end, then I suffered a lot, you know? <laughs> And the other way around, sometimes a very serious documentary, you know, because just because of its subject matter is much faster also to make because it has everything already, you know, so. <laughs> Playfulness is hard. <laughs> Hi, so um, kind of uh, building off the question on um, the relationship of reality and the digital age, I was wondering if you could talk about how the document fits into that and how your work as a documentary filmmaker fits into reality and the digital. Mm -hmm. Yep, so the, I mean, I, I was trained many, many years ago as a documentarist, and of course just through the um, explosive transformation of technology, also the nature of the document has completely changed since then, right? So you can, the, the contract of the documentary was in the times of photography, let's say, that the machine would guarantee that the situation before the lens and the um, basically representation on the sensor or emulsion or whatever were had some correlation at least or uh, were identical in the best sense right this was the machinic representation contract so of course now with digital it has morphed so much already through photoshop etc cetera, etc cetera, when image production became more and more um, it was happened more and more in post-production, right? And now I think with generative, it's shifted again into basically projection, into conjuring up new realities from past data. So it's completely changed. But the thing which in a way has not changed and which I think one can still really work on is not the content of the image, which may or may not relate to reality. You don't really know. Um, but the ways in which those images are made, because they leave, they leave traces in the images themselves, so they will always be documents of their own conditions of production. And I think there's definitely a truth value on that level, um, at least to a certain degree. It will always speak about you know, the situation in which an image was made, about the technology, about the infrastructure behind the technology, power relations and all of that. Even if the content does not correspond to any reality whatsoever. Hi, Jesus. Um, I just wanted to ask, because you mentioned it briefly earlier, um, because you mentioned the generative AI that you've used in previous projects, I wanted to ask how you personally felt about the newer uh, transformative, um, I can't remember, machines, I think that yeah. they're called now, mm -hmm. like Bing, et cetera. I just wanted to know how you felt about those. Yeah, I'm reluctant, you know, to use them. Uh, I mean, I do, of course, you know. I. I experiment with them, I try to understand how they work. Um, 
but I'm very reluctant because these are tools that are almost not under my control at all, right? They are handed to me by usually a corporation and I'm told to use it in certain ways and I have little control over the output. And also, I have no idea whether the output will still be under my control in a year from now, right? So it's like you, you want to make a painting, so you have to ask for the brush, you have to ask for the color, you have no control over the color, and whether the painting will belong to you a year from now is dubious. So in a way, I am very reluctant to enter this paradigm. Um, and I'm more, but I'm, I'm I'm certainly, I want to understand how it works and I want to understand this transformation. And I'm still, you know, inside, inside this machine. Hi. Right here. Ah, there you are. okay. Um, it's really interesting to hear you describe yourself and how you have, you're a philosopher as well. You have a doctorate in philosophy. Um, so I'm just curious, maybe this is the nerdiest question, but what you wrote your thesis on, because um, I've tried to find it actually, and, and maybe it's just my own, you know, bad research or something, but um, I'm just curious what it was and, and how that work informs your present work or how it's changed over time and, and where that root is in, in your research. Yeah, I wrote my thesis, of course, on the question of documentary and truth. <laughs> what else? It's called The Color of Truth, but it's only available in German. And yeah, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm still f following, um, I, I still follow the transformation of all these topics through all these technologies. But now people think I'm too crazy to do academic work. So that, that, tr that boat has sailed. <laughs> All right, we have one more question from right here. Um, I've seen the, uh, oops, sorry, it's too big. Um, I realized that you've been working in uh, your previous work. Uh, recent works have been incorporating a lot of technologies, um, especially the one with the beer bottles. Um, were you learning those technologies yourself or were you collaborating with someone else? And can you just tell us about the process? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I try to do as much as possible myself, which in this case meant to figure out how to get those bioelectrical signals and then put them, uh, then transform them into music and then uh, transform, getting the music to basically control the neural network, which I had, this was an old network, which I already had trained somewhere. So all of this I could do myself. The thing that my collaborator did was to basically uh, hook up the LED controller uh, to, into the bottle system. This I could not do myself. But other than that, the whole process, yes, and I had to learn uh, to, you know, operate these quite simple music softwares, etc. Thank you. Yeah. Hito, thank you so much for this talk. And I want to invite everyone to the reception at Tyler. After this, there are directions and cards on the table at the front. Um, round of applause. Yeah.